Good evening. Welcome to Yada Yada Radio. We've got uh, both Kirk and JB here this evening. How are you guys? Good. Good evening. Good. Good evening. Uh, I wanted to begin um, where we left off a uh, a week ago uh, with um, Chapter 19 of Observations for Our Time, because we uh, we came up against something, Kirk, that was uh, we covered both in the Observation Show a week ago and in this program last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was uh, startling. And we've come up with so many things that are just mind-blowing here uh, recently. Uh, we're on a quite, a quite a tear in terms of insights. Uh, you know, to go from the presentation of Yahshua Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 and realize it ain't speaking about Jesus Christ, even if you knew what his no. name was. Uh, he is absolutely unequivocally excluded and the person being discussed is named, and it's convincing. It's Dode. Yeah. And the, the profound implications of that, because what we're being told is that if you want to follow an example that will lead you to God, you want to be part of his covenant family. You want to understand his Torah and know how to observe it. The example you ought to learn from and follow is Dode. Is dude, and it actually makes a lot of logic. Yeah. Well, I mean, Dode is the only person that Yahweh said, "This is my son. I am his father. Right. He is right." I didn't say that of anybody else. Hmm. And Dode left us with a legacy of over one hundred psalms and twenty-five proverbs plus this extensive history chronicled in in first and second Samuel, first and second Chronicles. And then this prophetic record of his life that is prophecy both past and future that runs through the prophets. Yes. Yeah. That exceeds what we have from Yosha by I don't know, ten times, a hundred times. And if you count the credibility of it in the original language and it's the credibility of it being maintained as he wrote it mm-hmm. to us over time it's far uh, superior. a thousand times more credible yeah. and a hundred times more lengthy and well, we don't have at any point where uh, where Yahweh says after a after Yosha spent you know, his whole three years uh, in the ministry uh, and his mission where Yahweh says, yeah, you better believe everything he says. Uh, it's mm-hmm. been written down. It's correct. Uh, I have uh, I have endorsed it. But Dode, we have that. Well, Yahshua endorsed, uh, endorsed uh, Dode. Dode, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. And Very the person good. who actually um, provided the only eyewitness account of what Yosha experienced was also Dode. Right. But the Very reason that Christianity case. has to bury Dode, I mean, they bury Dode. Uh, mm-hmm. Is um, you know beyond slay, slaying Goliath with a uh, with a single stone out of a single shot, Dode is unknown in Christianity, and the reason mm-hmm. is is he is the antidote for Christianity. He alone proves that Paul lied when he said the Torah can't save. Correct. Yeah. He is he is completely destructive of Christianity, and you go from there to uh, to the realization that that Yosha supported everything that Dode had to say, and now you don't have a religion. And even in Judaism, uh, Dode's a death knell. Yeah. Because when the people of Israel said, we want a government like the Gentiles, we want Saul to be our king, Yahweh said, for you to choose your own government is to reject me. And this right. is the consequence, and Israel has tried to do that ever since. Yeah, they're totally so, independent. Yeah. Yeah, so Dode only too. exists for a very few people. Yeah, he exists for the covenant. He is the way, the sign. He is Zion to the you know, if you want to know you want Zion personified, it's Dode. That's why I'm so tickled by all of these Nimrods around the uh the world who are having a conniption fit over the city of Dode, Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. They named the capital of Yisrael. When 
No, I don't think there is a historical figure circa 1000 BCE that we have this much accurate information about. You know, there's a fair amount of information on some of the pharaohs and some of the kings of Assyria and Babylon, uh, dating back to, well, not Babylon to this period, but certainly Assyria. First Babylon, perhaps, yeah. not Neo-Babylon. Uh, first Assyria, not Neo-Assyria, um, the old kingdom of Egypt. But all of that was propaganda. Yeah. It's, it was it's who killed who and what wars they had and who right. was the victor. Yeah. That's what and it was all that. written to, by priests trying to unify the concept of government and uh, and priesthood such that the head of the government was a god. Mm-hmm. And so it's not written to prote- portray an accurate rendition of what happened. And there's no dialogue in it whatsoever. No. But the accounts of Dode are written to accurately portray what happened. Not to deify Dode. In fact, to, they, they're, most of what he did is embarrassing to Dode. Excuse and me. most of what we have isn't written by a priest trying to deify Dode, but by Dode himself. Mm-hmm. And and it's the only situation where we actually have dialogue. We don't have any dialogue from uh, Artaxerxes or Cyrus or... No, we have what the uh, what people etched in stone mm-hmm. uh, happened uh, in a manner to glorify. Made a decree. You might have that, but that's about yeah. It's very little. Yeah. You don't know yeah. what his thinking yeah. is, what he's feeling, no. his relationship right. with God. Nothing. Yeah. So he is. You know, it's extraordinary. So we went from that to then the next chapter of Yeshaya, and we're dealing with the Assyrian, and we find out that the Assyrian has. Very little to do with Assyria, and has all to do with Hasatan, Satan, and Satan's rise where he wants to be worshipped as God, and how he has menaced the world is all laid out in the story of the Assyrian, exactly how he would infiltrate government and religion, and how not a soul would lift an appendage to stop him, and no one would let out a peep, no one. Yes. Really sad. It is sad. And the next thing we read is that the story of um, of a stem, a choder that grows out of a stump of Yeshe. Yeshe is irrelevant to history, with exception of his son. His name and his son are more relevant than anyone else in all of human history. And we have the story of uh, of this stem that grows out of Yeshe that ultimately comprises a sign that Yahweh lifts up to accomplish several things. And that is the story that we're going to be pursuing again t- uh, today. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're going to do it for several reasons. One is that as a member of the covenant, particularly if you are were born a Gentile, you're a choder. You've been you're a stem that's been grafted in to one of the major branches that comprise the tree of Israel. You cease to be a separate entity. You're grafted into the tree that is Israel. So every member of the covenant is a choder. You know, I got lots of letters, and we'll we'll read some of those in future programs and say, you know, you are the uh, the choder. Well, I'm here to tell you, every member of the covenant. Is a choder, and we're grafted into a tree that's designed for abundant life and for us to be fruitful. You know, we talked today on observations, Kirk, and uh, there's one part of that program that I want to uh, lay out here before we uh, get into this uh, choder. And the second reason we're going to do this, by the way, is because uh, Yahweh explains how he goes about enabling choders stems, sticks, twigs, to be very fruitful. And he has a a seven-step process that uh, enables them to be effective for him. Working through them, uh, because that's Yah's way. He works through implements. A hundred percent, always, without exception, he works through implements. That is just what he does. And uh, the other reason is that there is no 
higher calling. There's no more worthy endeavor than to do something that God wants done. And what God wants done at this time is for his children to come home. Mm -hmm. And he wants them not just to come home to Israel, but to come home to him. And anything that any of us say and write that he can use to serve that end, the highest possible calling for our time. Mm -hmm. Nothing more rewarding, nothing more useful, nothing more productive than to do what God wants to do when he wants it done. And so the purpose of observations of our time is to reach them. That's Mm -hmm. the purpose. And God's very clear. He says, listen, Gentiles are going to be the first to benefit from this. He tells us that in the text of this prophecy. The Gentiles will be the first to uh, to benefit, and they will come home, and they're going to enjoy the uh, the home. And the home is presented using a term that's very similar to uh, to Ruach and very similar to Noach's uh, name, and they're going to be the first. But primarily, its purpose is to call the children of Israel back home, and then also to warn the Gentile nations because he wants them left without excuse. Mm-hmm. Don't get in my way. Don't get in my way. I like the way you Big mistake. It. Yeah, big mm-hmm. mistake. All right, so here is the uh, the story. I, you know, from in this particular account, yeah, I was speaking of a singular choder, a singular stem, but it's it's Yahweh's way consistently when talking about those that engage in the covenant and take advantage of its terms and conditions. To speak in the singular, you know, when we read the story of Noah this morning, um, and Noah walked alone with yeah. Yahweh, seven people joined him, but he walked alone before others joined him. Yahweh introduced himself to Noah before Noah uh, engaged on his mission. Noah then listened to what Yahweh had to say, did as he has asked, and he and his uh, family. Yahweh's family were spared. That'd be the same. And one of the things that I wanted to repeat from this morning is that I am of the conclusion that while it is possible to come to know Yahweh and engage in the covenant without God first directing you to Him, without Him first tapping you on the shoulder, without Him saying, um, I'd like to get to know you. Well, it's technically possible. We don't have an example of it. I don't think there's anyone in the covenant family that I'm aware of that has come completely on their own recognizance. And we also talked about, there's two other aspects of that today, and I want to lead into it before we start talking about choders, because it's a it's a high calling, a tremendous opportunity to be a choder, and we're all called to be choders. I don't think God introduces himself to anyone that he doesn't want to work with. And so if you want to engage and only receive the benefits of being part of the covenant, you really ought not respond. You're defeating the purpose. The purpose of all of this is to engage, to be active, to work together. Could God lift up his own sign and say, hey, Yehudim, Yisraelites, you're in real trouble. People hate you. You need to head home to uh, Yisrael now. I'll facilitate your uh, your coming. And when you get there, you need to uh, walk away from the rabbis and the politics and the Israeli defense forces and uh, return back to the Torah. Could he, he say that? that he's never worked yeah, that way. There's no record of him ever working that way. But, but it's never, there is no record he, of him yeah. ever working that way. Yeah. I'm not even sure he could because it's not in his nature. He's not in he nature created probably. man. I'm doing for this, I'm doing do this stuff for with. us, and if you don't want to be part of us, then I'm not going right. to do it. Not right. Now. Yes. He wants to work with us and through us, not alone. There's no reason to create a universe if he wanted to work alone. Mm-hmm. True. It's just not. It's not his style, and it's really interesting. I think it was JB that wrote this. I hadn't even considered it. That. Mm-hmm. There was a, uh, there is an advantage of having uh, that neck, this sign, 
comprised by uh, some Gentiles. Yahweh's home is magnificent, and yet the Israelites have walked away from it. Who better to tell them, look what you left. Yeah. Look who is asking you to come back home. Than somebody that it wasn't originally created for. No, we simply found what what they had walked away from. The the third thing I said as a part of the the program this morning is that while it may have happened, I can't say for a fact. After you um, tap me on the shoulder and say, "No, I've got a job that I'd like you to do," and we arm wrestled a little bit um, on uh, on it because it was he always requests, he doesn't demand. Um, and uh, he uh, clarified his position with the 91st Mismore Psalm of uh, Dode, in my case. Uh, it indirectly led to a unique investigation that I don't know if, if it has been replicated at any time over the past 2,500 years. And if there is an example of somebody who has gone to the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms yeah. and say, you know, I really want to know what do these words mean? What did he actually say? And then translate it, lay it all out, but don't, don't let it just linger there. Think about the implications. Make the connections. Try to understand what it is. Come to some conclusions about what's being conveyed and then lay it all out open on the table. Whoever's sacred cow may be gored, let them be gored. Mm -hmm. Whatever the truth needs to be known, let it be known. And this may not have happened at any other time in the past 2,500 years. And what Most we talked about again, do it. They, they, they could have done it. Well, they could have they done it, but they do wouldn't it. do it because if they if they uh, if they expose these people, they don't have a market, and they always do it from a monetary standpoint. It may not be a yeah. big one, but they're certainly think, uh, uh, almost looking for acceptance more than anything else. Or, you know, you didn't care whether you wiped out everybody right. and had no friends Correct. left. I didn't care. I was I'd be happy with Noah. He walked and you don't meet many people like that. No, and, but part of that is is our timing. You know, if you and I had tried to do this 200 years ago, a we would have no way of communicating what we'd learned, and b mm-hmm. we'd be tortured and killed. Well, yeah, yeah. And that would have been true for all of human history over the past 2,500 years. It's only during the last. 200 years that it has even been possible to survive this kind of uh, a project. And it's only been within the last 15 to 20 years that you could share with the world what you were learning. Yeah, because you couldn't publish yourself. That would cost a fortune to get anything in distribution. Never get the, never get the book out. It, it shut you down. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I had hundreds of thousands of people signed uh, boycotts against the Prophet of Doom and against bookstores that would carry it. Hundreds of thousands. You never get the message out. Mm. So, and the third aspect is that while there were libraries that you could go to that would have um, uh, film of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls really weren't published until the uh, 1970s, 1980s. Mm-hmm. And prior to the Dead Sea Scrolls being published, you know, you, you had some issues with the uh, the ancient text until the publication of the 69 pre-Constantine manuscripts of the Christian New Testament. There wasn't really any well-known source that you could go to to know that you couldn't trust it. And therefore, writing against it would be way scarier than anybody would ever even consider doing. Yeah. 
So the information to do it is now available. Now, the the lexicons that we use, you know, they've been around for a while, and I own them all in hardback, and they're uh, and uh, they're big and clunky. And if I was using doing all this and and uh, uh, looking up each word alphabetically, using the Hebrew alphabet to uh, blend kind of a Hebrew and English alphabet to look up these words, you know, I'd still be in the first book. In the first volume, yeah, I did it for a couple of years. <laughs> right, and then to yeah. to write in a way that you can communicate information quickly, uh, which word processing does on a computer, and I can send it off to our mm-hmm. good uh, friend Jackie, and she can uh, make it look like I'm a, uh, you know, I, I don't have 18 thumbs. I, uh, you know, it, and then I can get feedback and contributions from other members of the family before we uh, mm-hmm. disseminate something that didn't exist before, and it's instantaneous. I can send it to her uh, at uh, 2 o'clock my time. She can send it back to me at 3. So we're in a a different era. And then you combine that with the fact that Yashi Got 13 speaks specifically of how this sign is going to be used and who is going to use it and what they're going to do with it. And it combines three elements that weren't in this particular chapter that we're going to cover uh, today, which is Yashia 11. It says specifically that uh, the, that they're going to raise up their voice against the leadership of the world, the leadership of the world's religions and political and military institutions and societal leaders. Raise up their voice. That's what we're doing now. It's not just writing. It's also oral. And it also says that they're going to raise up their hands. And of course, in today's world, that's that's how you communicate. You you bring them to a keyboard, move them to convey this message. And uh, and Yashai himself is saying, bring the sign written by those hands and uh, and spoken by that voice, and may that voice go against the very doorways, the portals of every societal leader of every religious and military leader and be spoken out in opposition to them. And that's after, of course, it's been used to call the children of Yisrael home. The world is against them. The world's going to go to war against them. can be safe. And uh, and the stakes are high. Um, Yahweh says that in the uh, days or year prior to his return, Humanity is going to become rarer than gold. And then specifically, the gold that was mined out of a particular mine, which we uh, have the references to, and um, it's not a lot of people. The earth will be depopulated to the point that at the very most, depending if you model gold by volume or by weight, Mm There will be somewhere between 24 million, if you look at all of the gold that's been mined in the history of the world, down to about uh, 1,200, if you're looking at the uh, volume of gold mined from Orfer, which is the specific mines that Yahweh references. That's the stakes. Yeah. So with that in mind, that's what we're moving towards. Um, very few people are going to return home. Very few people are going to accept the covenant. But whether it's 2,400 people or 1,200 people or 2 million people amongst 7 billion people, uh, the more the better. Mm-hmm. The more the better. It's a big universe. It's going to be a bigger universe that he recreates for our entertainment. The more uh, good people with right thinking that enjoy discovering and spending time together and with you, the more enriched our experience on eternity is going to be. Yeah. So we invite you. Nobody wants it to be a small number. It's just that's the, that's the, deal. the way it is. Just that many people. Yeah. The vast majority of people believe don't that care. the majority is right. They believe the majority is right. You know, the Muslims believe that Jerusalem is the capital of uh, Palestinian people. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
Yashigan 11.1 <laughs> begins, as we know from last week, a small, <coughs> excuse me, I got the flu of <coughs> this program a, a week ago, and I'm still trying to throw the cough. A small stem, a choder, a slender shoot or secondary branch, a tiny twig or shoot, a tertiary sprout, a pliable wooden implement has come out from the stump, which is the rootstock, that which has been cut down and yet is still capable of supporting new growth, of yishe, which means existence, and to stand out, to be noticed. Boy, that is such a powerful name relative to uh, all of this. I'm not sure there's any name that better exemplifies what Yahweh wants from us. It's the whole concept of, of Kodesh, to be set apart. Stand up, be noticed. The whole concept of henna, the whole concept of of uh, the letter hay. Stand up and be noticed. The world is wrong. They're all going in the wrong direction. You know, Yahweh looked for the better part of 2,000 years and couldn't find anybody that was willing to stand up and be noticed. <clears throat> And you may say, well, it's, come on, it's God asking. Uh, certainly, he, could, he, he just didn't communicate maybe as impressively as he ought to have. Well, you know, the consequence of standing up and being noticed is severe. Yeah. You'll lose your friends. It'll devour your time. You won't have any allegiance with anyone. Yeah, you'll find uh, some other people... Along the way, that uh, hear what you have to say and say, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I want to be part of it. But, you know, that'll be a few hundred people among billions. There won't be any empowered person, any enriched person monetarily, any religious person with whom you can ally. So there aren't a lot of people signing up for that job. And when you put it that way, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what what happened? No, I know, I know it's true. We all know this. We're noticed. All, all of us were opposed to coming and know this. Yeah, what happens if you stood up and were noticed and you were opposed to uh, the god Asher and uh, and Assyria? Well, they'd stone you. Yeah. If what happened if you were you. against Bel and Babylon? Yeah, good luck. Against Ra and uh, in Egypt. What if you spoke out against the Pharaoh and uh, militarism in uh, in uh, Egypt? Sure. What if you said, you know, yeah, I'm uh, I'm not a fan of uh, of Dionysus or Zeus in Greece. Mm. You wouldn't live to the end of the day. Mm. You know, what if you were in Rome and uh, you were even a free man in Rome and said, you know, there's something seriously wrong about this transition from the Republic to Imperial Rome and of us uh, suggesting that men are now gods because these men who claim to be gods are doing nothing but fighting with one another. They're bleeding the country uh, dry, and we're uh, abusing everybody around us to uh, to fund our indulgences. There's something seriously wrong with this. Did you say wrong? How long do you think you'd right? live? Yeah, how long do you think you would live? Not not uh, to sundown. But how long did the critics of the Catholic Church endure? They had to stay out, stay on the move till they got them. But they got them. They got yeah. them. What happens if you criticize the Quran, Muhammad, or Allah? In an Islamic oh, country, cut off your head and your leg and your arm too. Yeah, there are not a lot of people that want to 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 become what Yishe implies to stand out and be noticed, particularly about the source of existence. So then this goes on to say a secondary branch from his shoot, continuing to bear an abundance of fruit, being productive fruitful while causing and enabling productivity and fruitfulness in others. And that really is the uh, is the goal of anyone working as a choder. Is that you study and learn and then share what you've learned mm-hmm. so that others can study and learn and share what they can learn, what they have learned. And that if you if you learn in the right way, which is to study the right sources by closely examining, carefully considering every word, 
and then making the proper connections from the proper perspective and form valid conclusions as a result. And then not only share the conclusions, but all of the analysis and all of the details that went into forming them in such a way that somebody else can go on the same voyage with you and then once equipped can go out on their own and explore. Mm -hmm. Then you're accomplishing the epitome of para, being fruitful while enabling others to be fruitful. Give everybody the means to do the same thing themselves. Yeah, well, that's that's what I'm, I'm sure you mean when you're always talking about putting your cards on the table. There's nothing you don't show in your process, you know, which was right. extraordinarily helpful for me to know how to do. How do you do this? Where do you go to do it? Just want to is not enough. You can be bogged down by all these big old giant books, and certainly I was no good yeah. at the computer at all. Still not, but I can at least matriculate through it somehow. Yeah. But uh, yeah. no, it's, it's yeah, yeah. You really do have to have more than the no, the want to. The want to is a, a big step. And an open to, of course, is a bigger step, I think, even than want to. Yeah. Because a lot of people want to know God, but they're not open to knowing him as he is. They're not they're not open to the idea of following the evidence to uh, to where it leads. And so the, the open to is bigger than the want to. And then, of course, the prerequisite of all of this how many people, before they know God, before they have the want to, before they have the the uh, openness, are willing to actually admit that you know there's a serious problem with religion and politics and mm-hmm. society. Why you know Noah had walked away, Abraham had walked away, Moshe had walked away, uh, Dode wasn't active, involved in the army or the uh, or the politics of his land. He was out tending sheep. Mm-hmm. He all walked away. And so that's another prerequisite. There's not a lot of people that want to disengage from society. But if you are, and you're grounded in what grew from Yeshe, who is the father of Dod, then this is what Yahweh is willing to offer. And while this particular choder that's part of this prophecy was provided these things, not unique. These same things are available to every member of the covenant who is grafted into Israel, without uh, exception. Now, they don't happen without engaging. You've got to capitalize on it. It's like, you know, I can have a really fast airplane, but unless I put fuel in the wings and know the starting procedure and am capable of, uh, of taking it off, and know how to navigate it, and willing to sit in that cockpit, and have uh, trained on how to uh, to land it, and how to talk to all the controllers along the way, and maneuver all of the systems, and read all of the charts. I don't care how sophisticated or wonderful that airplane is. You know how far it'll take me? No. Nowhere. Get in it and say, okay, airplane, you're wonderful. Let's go. No, won't go anywhere. I've got to have trained, studied, know how to read the language, know how to talk the talk, know which buttons to push, know the proper procedures. Otherwise, you're going nowhere. And if you try to change the procedures, you're going to crash and die. This is the right way of going about it. These seven benefits of the Spirit, and they're given in a group of six plus one, the uh, the one that stands alone is the spirits settling on and remaining. That's the unique one. The others are presented in three sets of two in terms of attitudes and attributes. They only work if you're willing to use them. And if you look at, uh, at Dode, I don't think there's much of anything that Dode wrote just sitting there out in the field contemplating the uh, the... the uh, air temperature and barometric pressure. You got to be studying and thinking about the Torah. Yeah. Um, about who Yahweh is, what He's like, what He's asking, what He's offering. 
for any of these um, attributes or attitudes to have any advantage. Mm -hmm. So the first is <clears throat> the spirit. And it's the Ruach Yahweh. Now that's the death knell for Christianity. <laughs> You're absolutely right. It is not the Holy Spirit. It's not a separate part of the Trinity. It's the spirit of Yahweh. The set-apart spirit is a maternal manifestation of Yahweh's nature. Set apart from him, that's why she's called the set-apart spirit, to function in the lives of his covenant children. And the spirit, Ruach, that's the divine power and energy, the mind and essence, the feminine touch and understanding, the acceptance and light of Yahweh, settled and remained upon him. She was placed upon him. In fact, this was written in the call perfect, which means that he wasn't born with it. This uh, spirit settled on him for a specific purpose at a specific point in time to accomplish a specific task. And the choder here that's being talked about is not alone. She enriches the association, energizes him, quietly allies with him, never departs, she assures a favorable outcome. She enables him to be composed and to prevail, no matter the challenge. There is a, um, a unique comfort that comes to working with Yahweh. You never once go into any situation without absolute confidence you're never worried about what someone's going to say. You're never worried about an unsuspected turn of event. Um, you're never worried about some bad guy coming in and trying to overturn the agenda. If you're working with Yahweh, you know for certain that you will prevail. Now, the definition of prevail has to be understood it doesn't mean that if you speak to a room of a thousand people, there's going to be a thousand people that want to join the covenant. Mm. It doesn't mean that if you do a thousand radio shows, there'll be another thousand people that will join the covenant. It means that you will effectively communicate his message. Yeah. You will answer questions effectively, accurately, and then uh, uh, it will be left to Yahweh, the Spirit, and the individual to decide what they're going to do with it. Yeah, yeah, which is, is going to want you to know what he had to say, wants you to know what he's offering, wants you to know what he's asking in return. And he wants those members of his family to convey those things. But uh, uh, success is in the conveyance, not in the acceptance. Individually, success is in the knowledge and acceptance. But once we're part of the covenant, success is in the conveyance. Yes. So the first thing is that the spirit settled and remained. Assured him of a favorable outcome. Enriched the association. Energized him. Empowered him. Spirit's there to do business. She is the, you know, the ultimate ever-ready bunny. She's going to keep on going as long as you can go. My body gives out long yeah. before she does. And a lot of times I'm here at 10 o'clock at night, continuing to pound away at the uh, at the keyboard. And sometimes it's my body gives out before the spirit is uh, is done with uh, insights. And you know we don't always come to things instantaneously. This is the spirit works with choders, us that are grafted into the covenant, very differently. I can't say very differently, but differently than Yahweh worked with his prophets, his Nabi. Mm -hmm. uh, with a Nabi, the, the spirit just of Yahweh just speaks right through them. They don't even have to understand what they're saying. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. They're, they're, they're being shown things. They're being told things. They're conveying what they're seeing and what they're being uh, told. A, uh, you know, a branch that's grafted on is is trying to analyze everything that's that's coming to them um, from the trunk, from the the major branches, 
you know, digesting all of it, uh, exposing it to the light, and producing fruit uh, based upon that. So this is a, an extremely different manner of communicating. It's why um, uh, the first day that I was really sick was Sunday, and I had had rewritten the, this chapter such that, okay, I'll accept the fact that uh, I am a, a toter and that um, that the neck is uh, is a sign that uh, could somehow be derived from some part of observations for a time. And I came back in uh, Monday morning after spending all day Sunday in bed, and I said, you know, I'm going to write a rebuttal to that. And I said, there is no way in the world that is inadequate as I am that I'm uh, part of this prophecy. I wouldn't mind being I, mean, I don't mind when we were talking about the vineyard of Dode and a mention of a choder, and uh, not a choder there, but a neck that, that came out and talked about the vineyard of Dode and how man had corrupted it. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't have a problem with that. That was that was something that was so small that, you know, myself and maybe three other people in the world were going to enjoy it. And I just thought it was Yahweh's way. I said, hey, you know, good job. You get a gold star. This time the the prophecy is part of a communication that Christians believe actually speaks of Jesus Christ. And while I know Yosha, and they don't, you know, I'm... This ain't him. Yeah, I, I ain't him. And so uh, I uh, I said, you know, no, no way. And then I realized that God could do so much better in terms of uh, a neck to bring his people home and particularly uh, coming out of the stem of Yese, uh, that he's going to have one of his own, uh, a chosen, a, a Israelite, that's going to write this sign. And, and so what I wrote is, I wrote two pages, I'd still in the chapter, uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> saying that my hope is to have been an implement that learned enough and conveyed enough that awakens the choder that is being described here, and that that, uh, that stem out of Yeshe writes the, uh, the neck. <clears throat> and I said, you know, and when I went to it, I said, the, the explanation, Kirk, as to how that yeah. could be is that when we think of the way that, that uh, you and I, and particularly I went out and did this, there's not enough time to replicate it. There isn't enough time to go and understand Islam and speak against it, and you need to do that. Yahweh is vociferous in his condemnation of religion. There is well, enough, awful I, I spent, areas that, uh, yeah. that are the Assyrians' deal, you have to speak against. Three, yeah. Yeah. three years, ten hours a day, six days a week, exposed to uh, Islam, and then thousands, three thousands of radio interviews. And then there's a bigger menace out there. It's called Christianity. Mm-hmm. And it took two years. I wrote that book twice. Two full years of my life devoted to that slime ball of Paul. Mm-hmm. And then they're starting from scratch, learning word from word, going from the creation account all the way through the uh, the story and coming to realize that there is no renewed covenant. The entire story is told in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. And what is that message? And what is the covenant? What are its conditions? What are its benefits? What are the mikre? What do each represent? What is God offering us? What is he asking from us? And to convey all of that, it's taken 10 years. So I said, okay, well, the Spirit's going to work through this uh, choder. Um, Doesn't have to do it the same way. And then I realized, oh, yeah, he does. Because if he was doing it the other way, which is the Yasha Yahweh, the Hosha way, the Yerma Yahweh, the Moshe way, God's going to speak to him as a prophet. Mm-hmm. He's well, not going to call this individual a choker. Pardon? Can I say something about that? Sure. He's already got uh, the tour is complete, right? Right. I mean, uh, uh, Hosha already said that, and and there are forty prophets, 
a significant number. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't need another prophet if it's complete. He doesn't nope. need anybody to say right. anything new. He ain't going to tell another nope. prophet. So even the two guys who return as witnesses are still quoting the Torah that's already complete. That is correct. Um, They're not saying anything the world doesn't already know. Nothing new. Prophet nothing Trump, new. Nothing. They're defending what's being said and saying what, right. what he and said. And there's no indication they're going to write anything, by the way. No. So no. that's not it. And so it can't be one of the 40. He doesn't need another one. Therefore, no. it's uh, superfluous to say Right. he's looking for some right. another prophet. So yeah. scratch off the prophet. You've already scratched right. off yeah. uh, Dode. Yeah, it's not a it's it's not too a, insignificant it's not a for Dode. It's, it's too right. insignificant for Yosha. Right. And you don't need another right. prophet. So all it is is right. it's a Gentile. So it, it right. has to be a Gentile. Who stands up and does that? And, and still, like, I don't know how in the heck anybody could get all this material in as a Gentile from our frame of reference, yeah. right. our, our type of culture, without working this hard. And it's already been done. So why, if it came at all, if somebody else could just pick up your books and, and memorize them. Right. Yeah. There, is, there, aren't, there isn't 15 years no. left to do this. And, you know, I, I'm not the fastest guy in the world, and I didn't have any qualifications going in. But I'm not the dumbest guy in the world either. No. And it took me 15 years. And, you know, who's got six days a week yeah. to do this 10 hours a day? That's, that's and he gives, big... gives up essentially everything except family to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's the, – and so if Yana was going to do it another way, the, the other way that he does it would be through a prophet. I am not a prophet. And if it was a prophet, it wouldn't be a neck. It wouldn't be a sign. It'd be part of the continuation of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. Mm -hmm. It's an entirely different kettle of fish. But what better way, if you're God, to say, if this nincompoop Gentile, not speaking Hebrew, not being born into the family, not living in Israel, not being trained in this in any way, if he could figure it out, and lay it all out for you. Couldn't you at least read it? What's your experience? Yeah, I would say that. I would tell people, look, if you read it and then convince me it's wrong. Yeah. <gasps> he figured it out. Yeah. Come on. Get Why, engaged wrong with you? in the debate. You can't, won't, won't you even read it? Yeah. Don't you even read it? You know, why don't you read it and you tell me where it's wrong? Enlightenment is okay. And, it, and, if, and if you read it and you find out that it resonates with you, like everyone who's ever read it, mm -hmm. resonates with them. If you take the time with an open mind and you read what Yahweh has to say, it resonates. And that's what God's saying. I'm going to hold up this sign. It will resonate with anybody with an open mind that reads it. That's good enough. And, you know, Jews have a superiority complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, the very notion that a scummy, lowly Gentile figured out what they were told couldn't be understood. Yeah. I ought to embolden a few of them and say, wait a minute. We need to take ownership of this. Hope they do. I want them to take ownership of the sign. It would be marvelous for them to do. All right, returning to the, uh, the ways that the Spirit empowers, and I just wanted to make the point of the airplane that this is not going to happen because you ask for it to happen. This is going to happen because you engage and you allow it to happen. Spirit providing the ability to understand, chakma, of mental aptitude and wisdom, of comprehension and technical expertise. It's from chakam, the capacity to learn and the ability to teach. Now, we're going to go through this because there is not a single person listening to this that shouldn't capitalize on it. God did not establish a relationship with you for you to be a sponge and nothing more than a sponge. Learn and then teach. Chakam mm -hmm. is the capacity to learn and then the ability to teach. He wants us all to do it. And I will tell you something, too, that is... Uh, has resonated all my life. Mm -hmm. You can read something and you can retain it for a period of time. You can read something and then write what you have learned down, the, the a, a synopsis of it, and you'll retain it for ten times longer. Mm -hmm. You can read it, 
write it down, and then read it out loud to yourself where you, your, your mouth is forming the words and you're thinking about the words and you're listening to the words, and you'll own it ten times longer still. Mm-hmm. But when you get to the point where you've read the material, written down your analysis of the material, listen to yourself recite the material, and considered what you've heard in your ears, and you've processed it, and now you're teaching out of that material, you own it. Yeah. You own it forever. It will guide everything that you do in the rest of your life. And that's why the first thing here is the spirit with the capacity to understand. Chakma, the mental aptitude and wisdom of comprehension and technical expertise that provides the capacity to learn and the ability to teach. What in the world do you think we're going to be doing in eternity? Do you think God's going to set up this lecture hall and say, all right, I'm going to uh, teach you uh, lesson number 50,779,473 today? No, we're all going to go out and learn every day. And we're going to come back once a week, however time is kept. We're going to share what we learned. Mm -hmm. We're going to enrich one another. That's the very first thing. I'm looking on my notes on Chakma, and it's exactly what it says. If you look it up, it's uh, wisdom, technical work, administrative, uh, Mm -hmm. prudence, it may from Chakma, another version, to be wise, teach his wisdom. Chakma. Right, and the capacity to learn and yeah. uh, the ability sorry, to teach. That's the verb that it's, uh, it's from, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, it's the ability to understand. And you know, it's not wisdom for wisdom's sake. No, it's to be put Wisdom to for wisdom's sake doesn't do you a lot of good. No. The only kind of wisdom that actually helps anyone is the kind of knowledge that leads to understanding that you are willing to share with others to enrich their lives. That's Chakma. I have found that the most interesting teacher in the world mm-hmm. happens to be my uh, my really um, extraordinary buddy. His name is Yah, best teacher in the world. I am certainly not his best student, but I am an enthusiastic student. But I'm also a um, an antsy student. I find that that my understanding and my enjoyment of the material is enriched when I share it. The spirit of Chakma, providing the ability to understand. What, of course, is uh, amazing about that, too, is that all religions are predicated on faith. And God yeah. begins with the ability to understand. Yeah. Oh, what a difference. And the second part of this duo is, and the capacity of discerning reasoned insights so as to become enlightened. Uh, it is... Uh, The root of this word is my favorite Hebrew word. Mm -hmm. B-Y-N is my favorite Hebrew word. It's written here in the feminine because it's coming from the spirit as bina. Bina uh, speaks of the process of of understanding, of transitioning from knowing to understanding. That transition is made by making the proper connections, intelligent associations, which lead to conceptual understanding. B-N means to observe, to consider, to distinguish, to discriminate, and thereby intelligently determine insights leading to understanding and enlightenment. We talked about this uh, several programs ago, Kirk, but Mm -hmm. without a filter, research is a waste of time. Yeah. You have to know what... You have to figure out why they're going this way, and then it makes sense. You know, I read eight to ten newspapers a day. Without a filter, it would be a waste of time. Mm -hmm. With a filter where I can discern what I'm reading, what, what is right, what's wrong, what's, what can be trusted, what has to be rejected, what's good, what's bad. With the filter, knowledge is powerful. Without the filter, a waste of time. And the end really is the, that filter, that ability to discern when you're, like you and I both translate, JB translates. When yeah, we translate... We are, uh, we, if you look up in one lexicon, 
the first word in most lexicons, most of the time, uh, is the word that appears in the translation that, that publishing house has made of that word the most often in their uh, English Bible translations. Mm-hmm. Yes. In other words, the lexicons were written to justify the translations. Now you've got to apply the filter. What does it say about that word? What what are the what's the root actual words actionable root? Where where can we find the same letters comprising other thoughts, other words in uh, in Hebrew? And what is listed here within the lexicon or Hebrew dictionary uh, that would be valid in this context? And so many Hebrew words have a dark and light side. Which side applies in this particular case, depending on the context? That's all bina. Yeah. You can't. You cannot treat translation in a conversation with God as uh, as zeros and ones, as simply connect the dots. It. You have to think your way through the process. You're always thinking, always investigating. I'm up against a challenge right now, and I talked to you about it privately mm-hmm. that, um, this morning. Yeah, I was speaking about arousing the Medes to take down Babylon. And the Medes played a really tiny part of taking down Babylon. The Medes played a significant role in taking down Nineveh. But uh, the Medes were wholly and completely incorporated into the Babylonian uh, Persian uh, kingdom. Uh, and uh, right after the... Uh, the um, sack of uh, of Nineveh, and the mm-hmm. sa- the sack of Babylon did not go the way that this is depicting it, and yet there's there are historically accurate prophetic presentations elsewhere of the fall of Babylon and the fall of Nineveh. Uh, Nahum writes about the fall of Nineveh, and and uh, <clears throat> we have uh, Daniel and others providing spectacular accounts of the fall of Babylon. Um, so, you know, I'm. I've been, Are you leaning towards it being more towards uh, uh, Iran future? I mean, our our time, Iran. These yeah, days what I'm uh, what I'm doing right now is I I've written five pages of the history of the fall of Nineveh and the Medes, mm-hmm. five pages on the history of the fall of Babylon and uh, the Babylonians and Persians and and at this point the the, the single unifying factor and of course it got me in all sorts of interesting rabbit chases mm-hmm. because of the uh, uh, my suspicion was correct which there really is no way to differentiate between Assyria and Babylon and Chaldea um, yeah. even the Medes all the same people come from the same places uh, the only thing that changed was the names of the kings uh, and the names of their gods yeah. uh, and otherwise the, the same thing and and so I have seen Assyrians over Babylon and Babylonians over Assyria. And it did get me into a very interesting foray into the religion of sin and how um, that was the final religion of Assyria and how the religion of sin became the uh, uh, the precursor to both Christianity and to Islam. Sin was a moon god, that just uh, but also how it, yeah, yeah. Just and how it even ties into uh, the creation account where the lesser light uh, yeah. would rule the night, and, the moon. and uh, it's a specific reference to uh, to sin and to the uh, the fall of uh, of Babylon. Of course, the chief god in Babylon was either uh, Bel or Marduk, depending on the uh, the timing. But even Marduk was the Lord Marduk, so it's a mm-hmm. one and the same. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll wrestle with it until um, we come to an understanding. I don't know how long it will uh, take, but that's the you know the whole process all along is you continue to make the connections, you continue to work through the material until um, the light goes off and you say, oh, this is uh, this is specifically what he's talking about. My sense was, since all of the precursor was the day of Yahweh, the day of Yahweh is not pleasant. No, you know we we no, all are time. excited about the fact that he's going to return. He's going to reestablish his home on 
the summit of Mount Moriah, and, and Dode's home is going to be built there, and he's going to uh, every, the earth is going to shake, and all of man's crud is going to fall into the earth, and there'll be this well of living waters that come out right from the uh, the epicenter of uh, Moriah uh, and the springs of Hezekiah, and they're going, to, and it, it's going to be a grand and beautiful sight, and we're all going to be there to uh, to watch that. Prior to that, immediately prior to that. Almost everybody on the planet dies, mm-hmm. and well, it's, it's not just God killing them; it's man killing man. Yeah, I mean we're we're gonna we're gonna depopulate the planet by ninety nine point nine percent, and and so with that being the preamble to it, I'm inclined to see the uh, the fall of Babylon in the context of you know Babylon has fallen has fallen uh, you know. Um, uh, in the context of that's the last thing to fall is the Babylonian regime because you know Babylon was absorbed by Persia, which mm. essentially became New Babylon. Yeah. In fact, it actually did become New Babylon. That's how that's how they, that's Cyrus called himself a Babylonian king, uh, even though he's the one that uh, conquered Babylon. Uh, and of course, Alexander conquered Babylon, but where did he stay and die? <laughs> Same place. Yeah, never got out of the place. No. Uh, and so, uh, and then Rome co- conquered Greek Greece, but <laughs> it forever changed Rome. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> Rome became uh, Greece with concrete. You know, Rome became Greece with a uh, a better established military force. But. All Roman ideas that have transitioned to us over time are Greek ideas. They and just copied everything. one another, and right. And then uh, R- R- Roman R- Catholicism R- um, uh, was morphed out of that. So uh, I'm in. I was inclined from the beginning to see it that way, and we'll see if that's mm-hmm. the way it turns out. That the Babylon that was destroyed is uh, the representative of the Assyrian and the Babylonian all rolled into one that became. The beasts of Persia and Greece and Rome and Roman Catholicism. Uh, the most troubling part of the whole thing, Kirk, is what we talked about too this morning. Before we go into the other spirits, <clears throat> the other there's only one spirit, but the benefits mm-hmm. of the spirit is that when we reread this morning the verbiage that Yahweh used to describe the twisted and despicable and vicious nature of humankind prior to the flood where he said, I grieved that I even made mankind and I engaged with him. Yes. The exact same vocabulary, the exact same words Yahweh uses to explain why he is wiping out humankind prior to his return. Well, that was so that's, you that's, expected, that's, that's really. Yeah, you yes. expected. I mean, he was so troubled then, and this is this is mega, ten times bigger. Ten I, times I, ex- I expected billion, it. So. I didn't. It wasn't fun to read. No. He's talking about our generation. It wasn't mm-hmm. fun to read. <clears throat> the next two spirits are, uh, again, one spirit, um, six Attribute. yeah, attributes and attitudes. And they're not all uh, uh, attributes. Uh, uh, well, the, uh, the, there is an attitude in the, uh, the list. Mm-hmm. Um, is the spirit... Of practical advice and applicable counsel. It's Shaw. Pertinent directions regarding how to properly respond, providing prudent consultation on the purpose and the proposal, delivering effective mentoring on how to deliberate relevant decisions. It is, uh, you know, the Christian will tell you that the that their Holy Spirit is the counselor. Really think about what does that mean. Mm-hmm. What's the purpose of a guidance counselor? Give you practical advice. Yes. What's the practical well, we used advice? We used to call to lawyers work? counselors. Yeah, well, I still do. You get their advice on but, these yeah, matters. Yeah. Serious matters. Right. Yeah. Right. You're still a counselor if you're a lawyer. What is the uh, the most pertinent, practical, applicable counsel or advice that we can receive? How to get. Uh, <laughs> To become part of the covenant, in my opinion. That's it. That's to it. To get to know Yahweh. To learn what uh, the advice on what Yahweh is offering, 
and what he is asking in return. Single most mm -hmm. practical bit of advice. Five conditions of the covenant. Walk away. Disassociate. Do what Noah did. Do what Abraham did. Do what Moshe did. Walk away from alliances that are political, religious, patriotic, societal. Say, you know, the things of man, man can have. Do what Noah did. The things of man, man can have. I, I'm going to live in this world, but I am not going to depend on these things. I'm not going to swear my allegiance to these things. I'm not going to rely on these things. Yeah. And what First thing you need to do. satisfaction of this stuff, no. Yeah. Yeah, I was not going to even tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, would you like to get to know one another until you've made that decision? You have to make that decision on your own. And it should be stunningly easy because throughout all of human history, human governments have been repulsive. Religions have been disgusting. They're so absolutely easy to prove that they're unworthy of our trust and have always been that way. So you have to be unthinking to mm -hmm. capitulate to them. And the second thing is to trust and rely on Yahweh. So you, it's not just away from religion and politics and patriotism and militarism, but to Yahweh so that you replace what trust and reliance most people have on their government or their religion, their society, their family, instead on Yahweh himself. Well, it wouldn't the make a whole lot of sense. Be just floundering right. out there. Okay, I know it's wrong, but now what? Yeah, it doesn't just say that Noah walked alone. He said he walked alone with Yahweh. With Yahweh, yes. Yeah. The uh, the third uh, is to walk to Yahweh and become perfect. It's only one path to Yahweh. It leads through the seven steps of the Moed Mikre. Each step of the way either perfects us or immortalizes us or adopts us or enriches us or empowers us, uh, uh, enables us to be effective troubadours, helps us be part of the solution that reconcile Yisrael and Yahuda back with Yahweh so that we can all camp out with him for all eternity. That's the path to him become perfect. Observe the terms and conditions of my relationship agreement is the fourth. And as parents, circumcise your sons on the uh, eighth day. Uh, essential. We want to raise our children such that they choose to become and are prepared to become Yahweh's children. And circumcision is about cutting off and separating, standing up and being noticed, being different, being as God intended and not man is intended. Those are that's the most practical advice that we can possibly give. Um, come to know and understand the five conditions of the covenant. Accept them and act upon them. Uh, answer the invitations to meet with Yahweh in His Moed Mikra, His invitations to meet. Observe the Torah. Learn from it. Share with others what you've learned. The uh, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sure you noticed that in every one of these attitudes, aptitudes, attributes, they're all feminine nouns. Every single one of them, with, without so, without exception. The ladies they're are all brilliant. feminine nouns. Yep. Yeah, it was the spirit of uh, of ruach, and uh, ruach is a feminine noun, and oh. she settled and remained was nuak, a feminine uh, verb. Well, the verb is not feminine, but uh, it is. Uh, it uh, was written that she is the one that remained and settled upon him, and then the ruach feminine provided chakma, feminine, the feminine of uh, chakam, the verb, and then uh, she provides bina, which is the feminine of the verb bien. Mm -hmm. Then the ruach provides esta, applicable counsel, practical advice. Mm -hmm. You know, the feminine of uh, of direction, the feminine of of uh, counsel, and then Even the of empowerment. Yeah, there's a lot of he Hebrew words for empowerment, for strength, for inspiring aptitude, enormous capability, the ability to achieve, to accomplish the mission, the courage, the character, and the confidence to prevail and excel. 
Well, it was Gabura, feminine. You know, it's not a spirit of weakness. No, no reason to be know, a humble boy here. We've already we've been talking about the mighty ones, the you know the right. Almighty and the warriors and the, this that, and the other. This is right. this is ultimate strength. Yeah, Gaborah, by the way, is a the feminine of Gabor. Mm-hmm. Gabor is the term that we read in uh, Yeshua nine six, speaking right. of the uh, the valiant and uh, courageous uh, leader that uh, Dode became. David, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is Gaborah inspiring that same capability, empowerment, uh, capacity to achieve, courage, character, and confidence. The big three. Courage, character, and confidence. Essential. I mean, Dode had courage, character, and confidence. God doesn't want uh, mealy-mouthed people. Speak out with courage, with character, with confidence. The spirit of knowledge, of knowing. It's interesting that that shows up late in the list, even though knowing is a prerequisite for understanding. But the reason that understanding stood out first is the single most important thing. There is nothing more important than understanding, and that's just Yahweh's style. I'm going to start off with the, the most important thing there is, and then I'm going to tell you how you understand. So it was the spirit of understanding and the, the ability to make uh, connections. Uh, and that, of course, leads to being able to offer practical advice. So long as you're properly empowered, you have uh, courage, character, and confidence. But then is the spirit of knowledge, da'ath, of recognizing where to look for answers. If you don't look in the right place, it doesn't matter how much you study. You know, if you're reading Paul's letters, you could become the foremost uh, expert in the world. And you are one sick, lost dude. Yeah, I, I find a lot of people when they first start this way down this path, they will instead of the reason it's important to read your books is to get an idea on how to search the Torah. Yeah. Um And and yeah. I, I, sometimes you see a lot of people who will go uh, still looking for somebody outside somewhere when the whole thing is in the Torah. Now, if you, if you can get to the Torah better without this kind of information here that's already laid out for you so well, <clears throat> then, uh, uh, you know, my hat's off to you. But uh, you don't need to be looking anywhere. It's always the Torah. Yosha said it's the Torah. Go there. Go there. You don't need everybody's opinion from everywhere else. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's just, um, I don't know, it seems like it, it makes it a hard road to, uh, to hold, you know, a hard road to hold if you're going to do it that way. But there's only one place to go for answers. You're not going to find it in the Christian no. New Testament. No. Um, you need you need to know where the proper source of evidence is and look there. Um, being able to discern what is revel- uh, relevant and accurate. Discriminating between fact and fiction, right and wrong. Being able to recognize and acknowledge the truth. Diath is actually from Yada, to learn, to know, to recognize, to acknowledge, to consider, to comprehend. And the uh, the final... Um, of the seven, the sixth of sixth in terms of uh, following, settled down and remained, leads to an, an attribute, uh, an attitude, I should say. All of this leads to a single conclusion. The more you know, the more you understand, the more likely it is that you're going to come to respect and revere Yahweh. And if you do, everything falls in place from there. Yeah. You know, there's a, a comment uh, from somebody in the chat room. It says, you know, that used to be like 50 to 100 people every week in the uh, the chat room, and now there's uh, a lot less in the chat room. The numbers of people who listen to the show is pretty much the same. But it, the chat room used to be a very divisive thing, and people wanted to shout and be uh, and to be heard. And mm-hmm. the overwhelming preponderance of the people that are listening to the show just stopped participating in the, the chat room. It became uh, too uh, divisive, and it was too much other people trying to uh, to show off, and they, they just stopped participating in the chat room. And, and more and more people realizing we had a tendency to go long. We're not going to go long tonight because my voice won't handle it. Mm-hmm. My throat won't handle it. But um, they uh, started uh, just dialing in and listening on the uh, the listener uh, line um, for the uh, the show. And uh-huh. there was a period of time because once we jettisoned the whole group that was uh, uh, was a yes, uh, an unpopular truth with uh, 
with uh, Larry. Um, uh, there was a an impact because it was it was a bitter bitter separation, um, and and we devoted you know this whole long show to explaining this is why we had to do what we did and and um, conspiracies and lies are very appealing. They're very attractive. Sure. And so there were a lot of people that never made their way out of it. And so you you uh, you might look and say, all right, so there's not as many people in the chat room. Same number of people basically listen to the program, but there's not as many people in the chat room. What is the best approach? You know, personally, Kirk, I enjoy doing this with you. I enjoy doing it with uh, JB. I learn a lot because, you know, you're looking over the same materials and, you're sharing what you learn, and it's always great to share what you know and love about. Uh, yeah, well, it's a fun thing to do. You know, but quite honestly, the thing that I love the most is still translating and learning from the the translations. And so you say, oh, what if um, just to hang it up and um, and do the writing, share the uh, the books, and and you know, I just came to the conclusion that do what you love. It doesn't matter if there are um, a hundred people in the chat room, or twenty-five people in the chat room. Doesn't matter if there are a hundred people listening on the phone or ten. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter if most people listen to the archives because it's more convenient in the time, or choose not to listen at all. Our success is never going to be measured in numbers. Our success is knowing where to look, learning, and then teaching. And so long as we do that, we're doing what Yao wants us to do. We're pleasing the creator of the universe, our Father. What better way to spend our time? So it doesn't bother me. Um, if, uh, if we were to pick up the phone and it were just you and I chatting, that'd be fine. I had fun with that. You know, we had a wonderful discussion with Scott uh, earlier today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, each individual live that is introduced to Yawa and comes to grow and in that relationship and comes to respect and revere him is worth whatever we pour into it. And the nice thing is that when you're giving away what he has to offer, Rather than losing something that you're offering, you're receiving vastly more than you could possibly give. Mm-hmm. The rewards of sharing, the enjoyment, the satisfaction, the sense of of ownership that you get of the material by sharing what you learn is marvelous, particularly if you take the approach of of recognizing that that God's not expecting a lot of us. He wants us to be enthusiastic. He wants us to be observant. He wants us to be conversant. He wants us to be thoughtful. He wants us to be open and rational. But, you know, he's patient. It's um, it really just relax and enjoy the exchange. Then it's a lot of fun. It is. I love yeah. to dig up all this stuff. And I have volumes of stuff we never get around to, and you do too. But it's still, yeah. um, what we do head on is, is thrilling, and maybe it's uh, excited enough that somebody else wants to sit down and read all this stuff and, and do their own thing as well, just right. to see what they add to it. And gosh, I like to yeah. hear about it. Yeah, you know, I mean, my favorite, of course, has always do. been to, uh, to put it in writing because it's enduring. Anybody can yeah. read it at any place. They can. It's much easier to verify, too, what's in writing. And to mm-hmm. think about what's there, and to do your own research when it's in uh, in writing. Personally, that's my favorite mode of communication. I I, uh, I like writing. Yeah, it was yeah, it was favorite mode of communication. Always has been, still is. His favorite mode of communication. He he didn't say he was going to lift up a megaphone. He didn't say he was going to. Well, well, he is asking that person to speak out. You know, it's not his voice. He um he likes writing. Yeah. He's very very fond of writing. Uh, he, he recognizes it's a very powerful means of communicating, and, and it etches something in stone so it's dependable and unchanging. Uh, but there is a benefit of us doing these 
reviews of this material audibly, because we not only augment what we have written, mm -hmm. but a lot of people's schedules don't allow them to spend an hour or two reading three or four nights a week. And they can download a podcast like this and put it into an M3 uh, player and uh, or just play it in their radio through their car. Well, you, let me tell you how I, I got up to speed, I think, much quicker when <clears throat> about 10 years ago we would we had the copies of um, all the books because Terry would print them because it's a lot easier for us to sit there in bed, you know, at night and we read each other or during the afternoon between classes. Mm -hmm. And um, what was really beneficial, we couldn't wait till your show came on because we could sit there with uh, copies of it and um, – what I used to do, I did for a long time before I even uh, started calling in. I would, I would listen. <clears throat> pardon me. I'd listen to you and JB and whomever, uh, and I would be writing notes on the side of it. But I'd be following because a lot of this material you're reading from what you've written, and then you're adding and adding and adding and and talking, you know, this that, and the other and discussing it. So I would fill up the columns over here with all the other stuff that we'd say and questions that I would have, and I do that to this day. I, as a material I'm looking at here, I, I, my first read through is I take little notes off to the side before uh, before I start comparing. Uh, the words I've translated with the ones you've translated, just to see if there's common ground or if I'm catching all the things that you are, or or how did you get there? Because the, because the Christian Bibles don't say that. So then I would go in and I'd say, oh, well, it does. It says it right here in the in the lexicons. That annoys me. I, I know we won't have time tonight, but a couple of the 11.3 and 11.4, I can't remember which one. There's some stuff in there, and I, and I was looking at what um, the – Average Bible says, and I'm saying, where did they get that word? That's not even close. Yeah. And I mean, I know it's the first one. That is, it it is, uh, proves your point of where you were speaking about a little while ago, where they write the lexicons to uh, aid them in in, in their translations. Right. So they put right. the word they want at the top of the list. And but you have to go down really deep, and all of a sudden there it is, and it right. says exactly what you said. Yeah. You know, and you translated and, it there. And eleven three is there. really important. You know, eleven yeah. three reads, and his ability. And uh, no, Yahweh writes in the singular when he's talking about somebody coming to know who he is and participate in the covenant. It's always written in the singular, unless he's mm -hmm. talking about the ultimate reconciliation of Yisrael and uh, Yahuda in the last days. It's always written in the singular. Yeah. It doesn't mean there's one person, but. Uh, he, he likes to speak one-on-one, -on -one, so he's going to use the singular here. So don't get caught up in the fact that it's it's one no, person. You personalize it. Yeah. yeah, it applies to all of us who are part of the covenant. And, you know, Hebrew is a language that is uh, is um, uh, masculine and feminine, and uh, the masculine prevails unless there's a specific reason to revert to feminine. This is speaking to uh, women in the covenant as well. And his ability to approach will be based upon his perceptions and acceptance, Riach, with regard to reverence and respect for Yahweh, and not by an appearance, a myriad, will not be through the visual form, which can be seen, or any spiritual revelation, marvelous vision, or supernatural phenomenon seen with his eyes, should he decide. Also, not by hearsay. Not by rumors or innuendos or rumor of mouth that is passed on from person to person, heard with his ears, should he make decisions and judgments. Now, that's a powerful statement. That's saying that, that the path to Yahweh is facilitated by perceiving and accepting the fact that he is worthy of our reverence and respect, mm -hmm. just as he is. And when you come to the point where you realize he is one marvelous teacher, a spectacular father, brilliant creator, stunningly effective communicator, and you come to just appreciate him for who he is, that's how you reach him. That's how you become part of his family. And then he's saying, but this notion that Christianity has, that it's by a visual appearance, forget it. You know, this... This, because you wanted to turn a man into God because you wanted God to be more approachable, 
That isn't the way that you find me. You don't come to me from an appearance. It's not the way you should decide. He's saying, then he, he says, and not by hearsay either. Don't believe what people say. Well, hearsay yeah, is. Like the testament, yeah. Right. Yeah, well, the whole to this here, yeah but, practically is hearsay. Yeah. He says, and, you know, what he's saying is, he said, listen to what I have to say. It's not mm-hmm. hearsay. Listen to what I have to say. Don't believe what people tell you. Don't believe that which is passed around person to person. Yeah, and that is particularly to the Talmud. You know, the oral uh, Torah. God said, don't believe it. Don't go there. Yeah. Don't go to the Christian New Testament where Mark and Luke were a hundred percent hearsay, as was everything written in uh, in Paul's books, the letters. Everything is a hundred percent hearsay. Don't go there. That's not how you should decide. That's not how you should make decisions. Uh, that's not the way it reads in an English Bible, but that's what the words mean. Mm-hmm. Then uh, 11, uh, uh, that was 11.3. 11.4 is powerful too. But instead, he should exercise good judgment. Shafat. Decide. Judging for himself by being accurate, honest, and right. Sadak. With regard to the doorway, now that, and provide that's proof. Yeah, no. that's where I stop because you know it doesn't say doorway. I mean, I no, saw not an name immediately, right? And I went through all that stuff to find Dale and, and Dala and and on and on and on. And then I went to the letters, delete, and it's and it's talking about the doorway, and they have some fascination with the poor. So mm-hmm. they changed it to the poor, and I'm going. It's like when Yosha, if he, if he really said this and probably did, you know, you have the poor with you always, and I'm here only for a limited time in, in your presence, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, mm-hmm. focus on me. <laughs> Don't worry about the poor getting these few pennies that right. you pay for this. Well, I mean, uh, this is this is. So I, I just, it's just they, their fascination would turn it into something about do-goodism, as opposed when he's talking about the doorway yeah. to life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, and can I ask you another question? How is sure. the D drawn, the Deleth in Hebrew? With a doorway. <laughs> so how hard would it be? This word has yeah. two letters. Yes. Doorway and uh, L, Lamont, which is the, uh, a, the staff. A, uh, this staff is the doorway to, lead to the you somewhere to rescue right. you to, it, out of a hole it, or to get it, you out of a ditch. It's the doorway whatever. to the shepherd. Yes. That's what the that's what Follow the, the shepherd convey. to the doorway or go to the How door could you not get doorway out of that? And doorway to shepherd. It's, yeah. it's with regard to the, the doorway pertaining to advice on opening the entrance, but also, you know, there is a, a connotation here of lowly and little, even the poor and powerless uh, oh, yeah. that have been deprived. But it's to draw conclusions regarding advice on being lifted up, which is the purpose of the uh, the staff turned the way that Yahweh has it. Right. It's uh Dalia, the branch of Yah. Dala, uh, and it's um, the word itself screams doorway to the shepherd. Yep. So I had no tr- I had no trouble with it. I just couldn't find them doing it, and I just said, "What, what are they going? What am I missing here?" So I did. Yeah, and I the only it. reference, the Three reason that it can also mean, yeah, yeah, because yeah, they wanted to be, uh, you know, be uh, uh, treat the. Um, the uh, the downtrodden fairly is what you know, the English Bible doesn't even read good in English, and, but it, it doesn't. Uh, you know, but instead you should exercise good judgment, being accurate, honest, and right with regard to the downtrodden. Uh, mm-hmm. There is a reason that dal can be derogatory because mm-hmm. there are two types of shepherds. Oh yeah, the worst shepherd who ever lived was Paul, and so yeah. dal does mean lowly and little. And so with almost everything Yahweh says, you better be smart enough to exercise good judgment, being accurate, honest, and right regarding the doorway that the lowly and little one opened, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. You better use some some sound proof and some sound arguments when uh, dealing with him. So it's both the doorway to the shepherd as well as the doorway to the lowly and little one. That, uh, and he's saying, exercise good judgment. Be fair, be honest, be right with regard to these things. Yeah, that's, a, that's a brilliant connection there. Go away to the low, lowly and little. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very good. It's, it, is, good it is both. Yeah, it's both. 
Yeah. So many things are conveyed that way. Everything uh, out in the open, and this is the part that I, uh, if Yahweh ever wrote anything that just uh, tickled my fancy, when he's saying, you know, I want you to be accurate, honest, and right regarding the doorway. And I want you to provide sound proof, sound arguments. Lay your arguments and your proof out on the table, and then I want everything out in the open, doing so fairly, by putting everything on the table, on the level, nothing hidden, justly, equitably, yeah. in a straightforward manner. Why and on for who? On behalf of the sincere who are seeking straightforward answers of the land. Oh, my. I mean, that was like uh, God saying, all right, you're, you're criticized a lot for... Uh, mm-hmm for putting into 400 words what uh, we wish you would say in four. And, uh, you know, writing uh, a book that's just just hard to go through because it's got too much information, can't you just break it down, give me the key points, and let's move on? I don't want a cliff note, though. Yeah, and what Yahweh says, no, provide the proof. No. Use sound arguments. Put everything out in the open, doing so fairly, laying it all Face up on the table, nothing hidden, do so equitably, fairly, a straightforward fashion. And if you do that, those who are sincerely seeking straightforward answers, well, they'll benefit. Well, you know, to your credit, you've always told us how to do this and how you do it, why you chose what you chose in any particular passage uh, and you openly debated your, between yourself. Yeah. Well, yeah. I could have done this, and they did this, and I did this, and this is why I did this, and they could have done that. Mm-hmm. And what do you think about it? Da, da, da. And they yeah, so you know, analyze the every, you know, like every word. Choice, right. So, uh, right. and and the you know, grammar is uh, uh, the letters as well. So, uh, I don't know how you could be more straightforward. Uh, and, no, I, and, I, it tickles me. I don't know how you could do beyond, that less uh, words. Beyond comprehension, less and words? God would say, this is the right way to do it. And mm-hmm. I, the only way I know how to do it. So I did it yeah. the way that I felt was the right way. I, I knew that this was, that if, since I was myself seeking honest, straightforward answers, and mm-hmm. I didn't want anybody to pull the wool over my eyes, I wanted to know the truth. And I was willing to go where the words laid. I figured that if anybody else is interested in the same thing, yeah. lay it all out. They're going to appreciate well, that's you what saying, you know, me ten years uh, ago. I mean, that you would yeah. do that right that way. I was really lay it all out. Don't try to sell them. No. Don't try to sell them. Just lay it all out, and and say, you know, I could be wrong, but this is the thinking that went into this. This is the etymology of the word. This is the context that's being used. This is what we've just been told. This is what we're going to be told. These are the various meanings of the uh, of the word. This is what other words comprised of the same letters uh, convey. This is the actionable root of the word. Therefore, in this context, this is what I, uh, I think is the, uh, the best way to convey it. But now you know all of it. Mm-hmm. Now you and you know, sometimes I'll just say, I don't know how they got to what they wrote in their translations. Quite honestly, I don't know how you get there. Yeah. So while I, don't, you know, I won't swear that I'm right, I can tell you that they're wrong. That's fair enough. Yeah, that's very fair. And it's, uh, yeah. but it is I the. Uh, I think it's the approach that uh, that appeals to those kinds of people, or who are going to enjoy eternity. I, I know you put this to bed uh, about Choder, but let me throw out one little thing that I found the other day that I thought was uh, quite uh, interesting um, on the letters. The little mm-hmm. two-letter root, you know, a chet and a tet and a thet. Mm-hmm. Yes. It means cord, and there's a positive yeah. and a negative side to it. The positive side, of course, is used for measuring and for joining and to link something, like you would link things with a rope. Uh, and the negative mm-hmm. side, you can err. It means to err, to refrain, to separate, or to bind. So right. a cord can tie you up like a bind, binding, like the binding mm-hmm. of a religion. Mm-hmm. Or it could give you a life rope to pull you up, up and out of the uh, mm-hmm. misram. Right out of that swamp. Yeah, and yeah, I a choder is uh, yeah a choder in and of itself is simply an implement. Yeah, 
Yeah. Implements can be used uh, to do good and bad. An implement sure. can be uh, used to uh, search Yahweh's word and share what uh, they have learned. They can be used to build a church, good or bad. Yeah, but, but the positive It all depends here, on, on you know, whose hand the, uh, the, the implement yeah. is in. And, uh, the, it was interesting that uh, Lisa uh, sent me, and I, I haven't, and I've read it twice, mm-hmm. and I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do with it yet. Mm-hmm. But she has never gone into Gematria before. The number sequencing. Mm-hmm. Well, she was also, and she's really a smart uh, cookie. She was trying to yeah. understand Choder as well, because there, there really is no. You got to work at Choder. Uh, Choder's not an easy one uh, to define. And you know, I finally came to the conclusion that uh, Choder is simply uh, a stem, and it's either grafted into the right tree or the wrong tree, right? Uh, depending on uh, on who that Choder is relying on. Uh, so I that don't every member of the covenant, yeah, is grafted in the tree of life, and mm-hmm. all other uh, choders are uh, are implements being used the wrong way, um, and they were all choders. Uh, my com- discomfort level was just being a choder in that particular prophecy. Uh, uh, it, it you know it, it was way too big for my pay grade, uh, but what she did is she applied gematria to, to uh, choder. Goodness, I mean it was stunning. And I, uh, I'm thinking about adding it to the at the end of the chapter. But I've, you know, I've never done number sequencing before. It's the first time, and the first time she ever had. And she says, you know, I was, uh, I was trying to understand it. She, you know, she says I, I saw you as in this role, you know, years ago. So he said this is not a surprise uh, to this uh, Yaudi, but um, the, the gematria on it is. Uh, Breathtaking. I'd like to read. So that. I will. Uh, I will try to incorporate that in somewhere into the uh, the chapter, and then uh, send it off uh, for uh, thoughtful analysis of the friends and family group, and see where it leads. Sure. Because uh, as you know, we we have avoided now. it. Yeah, the reason we've avoided it is the same reason she avoids it. Uh, Gematria is the basis for uh, Kabbalah, uh, the mm-hmm. rabbinic uh, spiritual. Interpretation or reinvention of um, kind of the rabbinic New Testament, if you will, would be Kabbalah of uh, let's all get along and play nice and good and bad and everything offsets. It. Kabbalah is the basis of uh, of the Force in uh, Star Wars. That's uh, why Darth Vader's uniform has Hebrew letters on it. It's uh, it's based on Kabbalah. Uh, every every nuance of the Force is uh, is a Kabbalah concept. Uh, and so we, we're both reluctant to go into it just because it is, it's so abused by uh, Kabbalists. But, uh, yeah, I was a mathematician. We should not be surprised that there is math and, it, and he defines words based upon their their numbers. Yeah. Everything with him is a formula. It's all 6 plus 1 equals 7. And uh, the only number that's uh, that's relevant other than than 6, 1, and, uh, and 7 is 8. And Choder is all about eight. It is eight from every possible perspective. And uh, that's what's really interesting about it. You know, eight is, uh, that's how many people are aboard the ark. That's the number of days we celebrate Sukkah. It is the spiritual number of infinity. Um, Eight is really an important number in Yahweh's uh, sequence of things. Um, You know, six is the number of man carbon-based life form created on the uh, the sixth day. Um, carbon has an astronomical number of six, six proteins, uh, uh, six uh, electrons, and uh, six uh, neutrons um, and protons. And it, uh, it um, atomic weight of six. And uh, man, without Yawa, is something but far shy of perfection. Man with Yahweh, who is one, is seven, the promise of perfection. But the promise of perfection only has value if it is played out throughout time. And eight speaks of an infinite amount of time to bring man and God together. So that's why eight is such an important number in the overall sequence of things. But... I'll do some work on it and I'll share it with you.
Okay, I appreciate that. Between now thank and then, my voice, as you can see, is beginning to fail. Yeah. Well, I'm, thank you I'm feeling much better. I'm it's actually feeling bad. fine, but uh, uh, yeah. this particular yeah. flu that I got down, was a bronchial um, flu, so it, uh, it really uh, well. racked my uh, esophagus and lungs uh, good. But I went to the doctor, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I got the full party Isn't pack of medications. I think I came home with five or six different prescription medications from the uh, the doctor. Wow. wow. Yeah. They, they took one look at me and said, man, you know, because the flu is uh, uh, particularly bronchial fuse, flus. When you get into your 60s, um, they can be deadly. They can mm -hmm. flat out take you down. Yeah. And she took one look at me and said, yeah, I'm going to give you everything. And uh, Teraflu was one of the things she gave me. She gave me Teraflu. She gave me antibiotics. I think I had, some, I had the flu last year, and I think they gave me a whole bunch of stuff like that. It was uh, it it show help though. It oh, Teraflu is a, a magic po magic potion. Well, that stuff is really really good. Uh, I tell you, that's yeah. just amazing. Um, but you know, the uh, the older you get, the longer it takes your body to completely recover mm -hmm. from uh, when it's uh, fighting off something like this. So. You know, I'll, I'll continue to have the raspy throat for uh, you know, at least another week. It's just part of it. I, I actually um, think I gained something of it because it was a really humbling day on Sunday, and I was so uncomfortable with this uh, with this choder neck chapter. Uh, and so uncomfortable that you know I spent a whole day um, trying to uh, to logically uh, discord Distance myself. Yourself, um yeah, I wanted to uh, wanted to do that, and and I came in Monday morning and I wrote two pages as to uh, how that could be uh, reasonably done. And uh, after I did it, I said there's one flaw in the uh, in this, and what's it's interesting is I I then um, that af Monday afternoon I wrote the flaw uh, down, which is um, it's a choder, it's a grafted on stem. This is not a profit. No. And therefore, um, it, uh, I can't wish it away. And mm -hmm. I got a letter from JB, who um, who had analyzed the entire thing. He says, you know, my approach was the same thing. I was going to say, uh, there's lots of choders and lots of signs, and uh, and uh, you know, you just contributed to somebody that uh, actually wrote one. He said, until I realized eh, there's not enough time unless the uh, the person who's going to write that sign is a prophet. And if it's mm -hmm. a profit, it's not a sign anymore. It's adding to the Torah and profit. It's no longer a choder. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. right. No longer it's a choder, and, and it's no longer a sign. Listen to JB. So, yeah. And I had to write JB back and said, God, you were crawling into my head. <laughs> what are you doing in there? <laughs> what are you doing in there? You know, it, it, uh, Kirk, it's, it's, it's really comfortable being a choder and being um, inspired in this way by the Spirit when you realize that every goyim that is part of the covenant is a choder grafted onto the tree of lives. And we all have access to and are equipped by the Spirit for exactly those purposes. So in all of that, there is nothing that is unique about it other than you know, there's only a few hundred people at any one time on the planet that are beneficiaries. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, special. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. pretty special. But they're, and, they're, they're Yahweh's people, and that makes me yeah. one of them. And I would have had, and earth earth. on that alone, right, yeah. I, you know, with the Spirit's assistance, writing a sign that God can lift up. I, I, okay, that's, that's way above my pay grade, but still, you know, I guess I'm okay. Yeah, you know, right. I wouldn't fight that. But, but in the midst of this prophecy, following the one yeah. on Dode, and then this one on this particular choder that's going to do this and the purpose of that sign, oh, man, that was way, 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 way beyond anything that I'm comfortable with. And so that's the uh, that's the reason there's a reluctance, and it was my conscience, uh, uh, Jackie, that kept on nagging at me. She does it in a very nice way, but the, the nag was, yeah. if you're denying something that is obvious, Aren't you in a way demeaning what God is trying to accomplish? Aren't you discounting what he's trying to accomplish if you're denying it? Just because you're uncomfortable with it 
don't you think that he brought this to light and, and spoke specifically about it in this book that you're, you're writing called Observations for Our Time, where you're the first to figure it out? That it's yeah, well, being done whole to, to from tell the, uh, yeah. on the same scroll that he's talking about. Yeah, right. Don't you think yeah, that Yao was trying to tell his children that they that he played a role in this sign, and therefore they should trust it? And for yeah. you to deny it undermines yeah. that purpose. Yeah. yeah, you may want to think this through, friend, before you do that. Now, she didn't say it that bluntly or that harshly. She's She's too sweet to do that, but mm-hmm. that's what the word said. Yeah. And so then it became my uncomfortableness approaching something that that could be considered presumptuous and way above my qualifications and capability versus I'm uh, not discounting what I was trying to do. And that's how I left the chapter. So we, uh, we'll we have more to learn about uh, the sign uh, in future programs. We just made it to Yashaya 11.4. And uh, we still have uh, some meat on the bone back there in uh, uh, observations for our time. Uh, a little nine. bit for next week on 9, yeah. And then we'll be through with yeah. 9. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I enjoyed doing this with you. Have a, uh, a lovely rest of your Shabbat. Time, you work in the part of my second night of you, yeah. Oh, J- JB uh, actually uh, Ted told me that he was taking the time off. I saw another uh, area code oh, began with a nine, so I thought it was JB. Yeah. yeah, no, JB has not been uh, with us. He uh, oh, okay. he had uh, he's out of town uh, today, so it was just uh, you and I and oh, I somebody else with a with a nine first digit in their area code uh, called in. Okay. All right, my friend, I enjoyed it immensely. All right, As good always. night. Bye. Good night. God bless. Shalom.